Wildwood Trust is a charity we set up to create a place where people can come and learn about rewilding, learn about how rewilding can happen, also get a feel for the animals in a Britain that is rewilded. The lynx, the wolves, bringing back pine martens, red squirrels, all the animals that we could have back in this country. That's what we want to do at Wildwood Trust and we now want to do that at other places in the country. So Wildwood is creating a place where people can learn to live with our little friends here oh. and learn to live with nature. Right, creating the Wildwood. I'm going to give a quick talk on um, our organisation and our foundings and then I'm going to blow your minds with economics. And um, you've got to bear with me with economics because it is the root of all the problems we face in nature conservation. It makes everything so much harder. And it's taken me many years to understand. But Wildwood, um, the dream of a British wildlife park, it initially came about Terry Stanford back in the 70s. He was a forester and economics played a role very much in that man's career. He was, a, um, he was the operations director for English Woodlands and they weren't a forestry company. They were a tax dodging company. So they took money from very wealthy investors to avoid capital gains tax, bought woodlands as their agents. Terry's job was to manage them, which they got grants for, and they destroyed most of the um, chestnut coppice around here and planted Corsican pine mostly and lots of other things. So all that wildlife disappeared. Now Terry saw all the wildlife disappearing and he was sad because he loves nature and he wanted to do something about it. So, as Johnny Mitchell said, we chopped down all the trees and put them in a tree museum. And that started off with Wild and Wild, Wildwood Woodland Park. Um, and slowly over time, that morphed into what is Wildwood. And um, the other person's dream is this chap, Ken West. And he's the founding chairman of Wildwood and my friend. It's not every day I look for a man in a wood, but I'm told if any man can help me track down a dormouse, it's Ken West from the Kent Mammal Group. Oh, Ken, oh, good yeah. to see you. I'm nice very well. You. Now, as happy as I am to see you, I really want to see these dormice, right. so lead keep on. Your, keep your fingers crossed. Here we go. Oh, there are, there are. Did you, did you see him? Did you see him? Oh, look, look, look. Oh, look. Oh, look, 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 look. And he was a trustee at Kent Wildlife Trust, and when we decided to reintroduce beaver at the Ham Fen Beaver Project, which was um, a long time ago, 1998 was when we first started thinking about it, um, we quarantined the beavers in the park here. And Ken had always been interested in creating a British wildlife park and a conservation charity, and is very much involved in a number of other charities, founded the Kent Mammal Group and other things. And he supported the efforts of myself and John McAllister in the, the Ham Fen Beaver Project, which was, I suppose, the first major rewilding project in the country. And so it's his dream as well, and he's been the driving force. Then, of course, there was my dream. Well, Wildwood has taken its, its philosophy from the pioneering work of people in Holland and in Germany, where they've started recreating these wild habitats using wild horses and wild Wildwood have imported European beavers from Germany. They've not roamed our forests for over four centuries, something Peter Smith hopes to change. I couldn't believe I'd seen a beaver in the wild. To get closer to these fascinating mammals, I've come to Wildwood, a woodland discovery park near Canterbury, where we can all see these creatures up close and personal. I received a very wet welcome and met the man with all the beaver knowledge, park manager Peter Smith. What are you doing? The man's a fool. He's gone, he's gone insane. In that, it's full of carbohydrate and you can eat it. You can wander down the stream. We can see signs of their activity and how they're helping hydrate the woodland around us and create uh, the conditions for all the rare wildlife that lives As you go down the river, we can see that the beaver have created all these, these bits of wetland around us, and that acts like a giant sponge. And if we had beaver in every river in Britain, that sponge would help soak up floodwaters and actually save our towns and cities from catastrophic... Look at the mother flooding. grooming the young there. Oh, that's really lovely, that. They've got... Oh, you can hear a little... Oh, did you hear that? Gorgeous little they sound They were hunted the down there. by farmers to protect their animals. 
The only place you'll find them these days is in wildlife parks like Wildwood near Canterbury in Kent. The relationship between man and wolves goes back many, many thousands of years, many tens of thousands of years. The first domestic animal was a wolf. Humans have got a real affinity with wolves, very deep. Peter is happy to go in with the wild pack. Humans are funny big monkeys to a wolf. They don't know how to attack us. It's amazing seeing them fit through the trees. You, you get the feel, just like our, our, our Neolithic ancestors did, running. This is probably as close as a wolf will come up to me. This is quite dangerous, that we don't want the wolves getting too interested while we're in their enclosure. So they don't get too spooked and they remain calm. It's all worked pretty well. We had a few little moments there. We lost them a few times. Here they come again. That's what you want. You want a scratch. As far as Peter Smith is concerned, there's nothing more important than the conservation of nature. We've lost 90% of our rare meadowland. We've lost 50% of our woodlands. There's so much wildlife dying out. We are part of nature. Mankind is not separate from nature. We need nature. So, our foundations, we came about the Wildwood Trust because of the beaver reintroduction. And very quickly after that, the Connex, the wild horses, of which we've got about 140 on various nature reserves from right up in North Scotland to Wales and with other organizations. Um, and we've got quite a lot in Kent. And that's, and we've got some in the woodlands behind us, helping recreate some nice wooded heath. So that's our foundation. So we're very much on a rewilded basis. We also got involved heavily in water vole reintroductions and dormouse reintroductions. And you'll probably see some of that. But the charity was always founded on education and training. So we get about, we'll get nearly 12,000 kids through the doors this year. Um, on, on education visits. And obviously we try to include rewilding in that. We developed training um, uh, courses and we manage a lot of practical training courses on how to monitor and uh, animals and stuff like that. We're a community organization. We try to be very, very um, important in the community and that helps us a lot. So we, we offer all kinds of uh, freebies for um, disadvantaged people and other things like that. So we're well respected in the community. It's very handy, the local MP, the local councils, if I say boo, they'll actually do something. And that's proving yourself useful to the community, community power. We're also a membership organization. We've actually got 50,000 members, which is more than most wildlife trusts. And that's been growing rapidly. So that's, um, Part of what we want to do is build a, a membership base of people who will enjoy um, wildlife and rewilding. And public presence and advocacy for rewilding. Obviously, we want to promote rewilding and we do that as much as we can um, with, with um, mostly television. And I do a lot of campaigning. My first job was in campaigning, so I, I, um, I get behind the scenes and sometimes talk to government ministers and make presence felt, know where to apply pressure, know where to make a big difference, if you can. So where are we now? We're 13 years old as a charity, we've got 50,000 members, we're financially secure, we'll turn over probably about nearly 2 million quid, just under 2 million quid last year, and uh, we're growing quite quickly. Um, we've got a growing reputation and public profile, which is very useful, and uh, I'm about to open next month the next wild ride which would be nice but we haven't signed the date lease yet so i've got to uh, keep quiet about that um, and i want to create a university of rewilding one of the projects we've got is to create a residential education center here and we want to open that up not only for school children but for people to come and learn practical skills in managing animals and all the more complicated things that you need to know in rewilding 
Um, I want to open more Wildwoods. I'm in talks to open one in Scotland and I'm looking. So the model we've picked is just the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust model, Peter Scott's model, and we're trying to do that exactly here with Wildwood. And um, so, ooh, yep. Understanding the complex problems of rewilding, and they are complex. And I'm gonna do your brains in now with some complex stuff, but bear with me, listen to what I've got to say. We've got to create a space for nature to flourish. And that is very hard. We've got to understand the perverse incentives that exist within our society and economy that stop us creating a space for nature to flourish. We've got to understand in economic terms the value of nature. How, what are the issues around it? We've also got to understand the corruption of economics because the economics as a science and profession has been deeply corrupted over more than 100 years. It's not that we need new economic thinking. All of the economists over many hundred years have already told, given us all the answers. The problem is, is if you start talking about those answers, your career as economist will stop and you won't get um, into positions of power because economy, the economic science has been corrupted and I'll explain why that is. We've got to think about political privilege and abuse. Political science, understand why decisions are made the way they are and deeply understand that. And why, again, that causes problems for anybody trying to rewild. And all of that, you can understand all you like, but if you don't have practical solutions, remedies to the problems, then you can't achieve your objectives. So we've got to understand what are the key remedies to take away all of the economic impediments to rewilding and allow people to flourish and have jobs and actually increase their wealth. Sounds mad, but it's possible, very easily possible with a few key changes. So creating a space for nature to flourish, practical rewilding skills and the not so practical ones. How do you import a lynx? What are the, the knowledge that you need to do? the actual physical transport, the health of the animal, the veterinary knowledge, all this, holding it, quarantining it, applying for the right license, a European Protected Species license. You've got to go to DEFRA to have your quarantine facilities under um, various regulations. You've got to have an actual import license so you can do it. Where do you get it from? Is there any legislation over there? These are the things I wrestle with and do all the time to import our animals and learning all of those. You've got other issues to do with land, where it's going. Do you need any licenses for that land? Is it, is it on a triple SI? You'll have to get that approved um, under by Natural England. You'll have to get lots of other things. Is it a dangerous wild animal? You'll need a dangerous wild animal license from the local authority who issue it. There's a huge range of legal, technical, issues to learn and that's why Wildwood was created to solve those problems to provide that expertise to other organizations. Spatial planning. This is a really good idea. A spatial planning just means we decide what goes where. The Dutch tried this um, a good few years ago and they decided they were going to give over five percent of their country to their nature grid. It stopped because all the easy stuff of getting, you know, Oostvaders Plas and, and other areas, that was easy. But once they started building the nature grid, started impacting on other people, on people who wanted to make profits from that land, who wanted to build houses, who wanted their farmland not to be touched. And so they abandoned it. But spatial planning is an exceptionally good idea where you actually say, we're going to have this and that and that. We don't like planning in this country. We don't have planning in this country. It's appalling our planning system. Basically what we have is lots of people busy trying to give a bit of cash here and there to get planning permission because so much money is made through the planning uh, thing. If you look at how much money is made through the planning system, there's more than enough to rewild the country and to get rid of poverty. Planning is worth that much, but we need to tackle the planning system. Joining it all together, the idea of a, a nature grid, your island biogeography, population modeling. There are good countries that do do some of this. 
um, the Scandinavian countries and things like that. Again, our organisations, uh, Natural England, um, DEFRA, they're not doing this properly. Population modelling, they, they, they'll say they're doing this, but it's, it's, it's pretty rubbish because they can't get a hold of land. If you can't influence what happens to land properly, and these civil servants will run away screaming if you talk about trying to get hold of land because they know their careers are going to be destroyed in the process. So we need systems that will be able to give the knowledge to plan a nature grid. Homes or wildlife, I'm always, that's always a good one. We're, we, we're in a housing crisis at the moment. Can we decide, are people going to have a nice place to live or is there going to be wildlife? Well, housing is probably just over 2% of the land of Britain. It's a minuscule amount. In fact, golf courses probably in England occupy more space than housing. So is housing a problem to wildlife? It's not. It's a tiny proportion. When I was working in other organisations, I would say, well, yes, you're campaigning against house building and development, but 95% of wildlife loss is because of changing in land use in the rural environment, not in the urban environment. Why are we spending all our time trying to stop housing, right? And why don't we tackle the issue with farming? And of course, nobody wanted to hear that because it's talking about land use. Yeah, it's okay, because if you talk about housing, it's NIMBYs don't want another house built next to them because that might decrease the value of their house. And that's really, it's, it's all about that, that perverse incentive. So the idea that you can't have decent housing and wildlife is rubbish. Um, food or wildlife? Well, we've already seen, Peter told us, about 40% of the UK shouldn't be farmed. In fact, it's uneconomic to farm it. We have to give it subsidy to actually get somebody, to pay somebody to destroy the wildlife there. Sheer and utter madness. The also, when we come to food production, we probably produce about 10 times the amount of calories we need to eat and have a safety margin in this country. We waste a huge amount of food. The inefficiency of how we use land is unbelievable in farming. You might think it's heavily used, but it's not. It's inefficient. We need the economic systems to make farming efficient. And we certainly can afford, well, we can, it'll actually save us money by getting rid of farming so we can have 40% of the UK back as rewilded. There's nothing stopping us. In fact, your taxes are, are being taken away to give people, to pay them to destroy wildlife. Uplands. We talked about the uplands, mostly that is. There's other areas as well. We've also got floodplains that need to be regenerated. They will actually, when you look at the economics of floodplains, that would actually pay for themselves in the benefits they give to other people in reducing flooding, water quality. And that's even without going into carbon storage um, because wetlands, especially PT wetlands, can absorb a massive amount. Um, and I'll talk about that in my next talk. Um, also, coastal buffers. Now, the example I always give about coastal buffers is, why, why do we need the Thames barrier, or even spend 40 billion quid on a new Thames barrier? These coastal surges, well, A, we've got too much drainage up in the uh, Gloucestershire and Oxfordshire um, high plain on the Cotswolds and all those rural areas around there that's draining water too fast and it all comes down to Teddington at the other side of London and that water comes down and then we've got our storm surges which are low pressures that come down the North Sea and they allow the water and then the tide rises and you get this pinch point where it could flood the whole of London. But if you look at how the Thames estuary is all of the salt marshes and have been taken away and you've had flood defences and then you've got farming behind it or you've got it's sea salt as some idiots bought all the land thinking they could put houses on there well they can't um, so that is what used to absorb the storm searches in this moment I always like to say I want to be a conservationist of Jellignite apparently the most environmentally friendly explosive. 
And if we blew the um, flood defences at the Wonsome Channel, added a few key points as you come down the Thames estuary, that would do more for resisting the storm surge than a new Thames barrier. And it would also, to get a hold of the land, would probably cost less than paying for a Thames barrier. But you can't do that because locally, I can assure you that the Environment Agency is utterly committed to spending an unfathomable amount of money putting in flood defences where they're just not needed, where we've, we're just creating farmland that we don't really need. It's not even protecting houses. It's, it's madness. And the cost to protect, protect that farmland is astronomical. It's hundreds of times the economic benefit that we get from that farmland. It is sheer, unadulterated economic madness. And all that could be lovely. So coastal buffers, floodplains, uplands, golf courses, get rid of them, mad game. Um, we've got more than enough land to have an amazing rewilded habitat that would not cost any jobs, it would increase jobs. So the economic arguments don't stack up if you look at it in aggregate. So the perverse incentives that we have in our society that creates this, this terrible um, wasteland of no wildlife. First off is agricultural subsidies. Agricultural subsidies are sheer madness. Taking money from the hardworking and poor people to give it to a few wealthy landowners because the farmer doesn't get the agricultural su um, subsidy. Oh no, most of the farmers in this country have to rent their farms. So what happens when you give an agricultural subsidy? The rent goes up, that's all. That's Ricardo's law of rent. So you, the, the farmer doesn't benefit. We don't benefit. Most of that money gets siphoned off. And um, probably a lot of it ends up in Antigua or the Cayman Islands or wherever. It is, it is a mad idea to subsidise farming. You're not helping it. And then you look at the perverse incentives of subsidised farming, where a lot of the subsidies we have for farming end up destroying farming and poor people's incomes in other countries and we regulate markets to destroy the economies of third world countries. Marvellous, isn't it nice to know that we're causing starvation around the world just to enrich a few landowners. Tax dodging, the other perverse incentive, the ownership of, and I'm not talking about illegal tax dodging, I'm talking about perfectly legal tax dodging. The ownership of a land attracts an amazing amount of privilege in our tax structure how we can offset various forms of um, inheritance tax, the capital gains associated with it. Capital gains, if you develop land and then buy land with that money, you don't have to pay it. There are so many rules and regulations in our tax structure that means the ownership of land, and farmland or commercial woodland, where you're reducing the biodiversity, you get money in your pocket from the taxpayer. Tax allowances. The idea of tax allowances is another issue that's monstrous to um, conservation. Tax allowances are, if I want to buy a tractor and I pay income tax as a farmer, I want to buy a bigger tractor, right? Or I want to buy some other thing that intensifies it. Uh, that which I buy is offset against the profits of my business. And you can do that as a landowner much better than you can do it as if you're a businessman. You get to offset it for over five years. And that goes for any structures you build. You can offset that spending against your taxes better than any other business. Most people would kill to, I wish I could do that, to offset the taxes my charity pays if I had to buy anything. I can't do that. We at Wildwood, we have to pay that, we have to pay national insurance, we have to pay... In fact, if you look at the tax rate of most charities, it's actually much higher than landowners. And that's the tax structure we've got. So tax allowances, get rid of them. All that does is actually converts... When you employ somebody to do a job, it's much better to buy a new computer or a new machine that uses... Um, natural resources because the tax structure is always pushing people
to buy rubbish that they don't need or buy bigger rubbish that they don't need. Then we've got externalities. In most of externalities, simple word, it's, it's something that is, is external. It's, it's when you pollute, when you cause a problem to somebody else, that's an externality. Our economic system hates externalities. They want to reduce externalities, get rid of them. Economists stand up there and shout and scream and say externalities are terrible. You can't put externalities into our economy. We need, because externalities is theft. If you pollute the air, if you poison the river, if you do something, that's an externality. And you are stealing from our children and from other people. And that's the basic way we have to think about it. It's not about, it, it, it's a deeply moral issue. We shouldn't thieve and steal from other people, and especially our children. And that's what we're doing at the moment. And we don't want to include externalities in our economy. So we come on to the last thing, the taxation of labor and capital, right? And by taxing true capital and labor, and not taxing these other things we talked about, solutions that require people, that would create jobs, that would help farmers farm in slightly less intensive way, that would be just as economically advantageous, are not followed because we're taxing wages. We're taxing um, certain types of true capital, but externalities, land, and the profits of farming or whatever, they the profits derived from the destruction of wildlife are not taxed. So we're, we're always pushing our system to use less people and more things that destroy the environment. So the value of nature, value theory. At the moment, um, we've got to think about how we value nature. At the moment, there are two big schools of thought in academics. You have intrinsic and extrinsic value theories. The, the, the way to do it is an intrinsic theory means something is a value. That um, projector, it would cost me X amount of money to replace it. Or if we had, um, say, what's the value of a, a river? How do we replace it? How do we bring that water quality back up and things like that? Th there is an inherent value. This is hated by modern economics practice. They loathe the idea of intrinsic value. All of the neoclassical systems and models have to have a extrinsic value theory, which is what somebody prepared to pay for it. So what is somebody prepared to have clean water? Well, it doesn't compute. And you've got problems coming now where a lot of us are getting onto these, the economists are starting to think of what's called eco ecosystem services where you're trying to value what is something and it's practically impossible because modern economists won't recognize the intrinsic value of something and the complexities of that so value theory is really good again externalities we don't know how to value them we don't know how to put them into our economy there's no mechanisms in the way our government works that will put these things and make them into a sensible value and the taxation of things that reduce externalities, again, loathed by our political system. Um, a carbon tax, putting petrol prices up, anything like this. The, the way they, they try to subsidize wind turbines, it's barking mad, it's nuts. Why do you want to go and say we're gonna, we're gonna um, subsidize wind turbines? It's, it's madness, because it, all it does is create a lot of graft and corruption and deceit. All you have to do is tax the carbon, the, the pollution, its source of oil and gas. Let the free market decide how we're going to create wind turbines or solar or whatever. It'll stop the graft, the corruption, the inefficiencies that we have inherent in our economy. Yet, for some reason, our governments and uh, the mainstream economics will not address that. Okie doke, the corruption of economics. How did this all come about? Well, it happened about 120 years ago, where there was a big fight between classical economists and neoclassical economists. And that's the thing you've got to learn. So this is where 
Many of the solutions to the world's problems already existed in the economic theories that were over 120 years before, because they had three, have I got a pointer on this? One, two. They had three basic systems for understanding the economy and the factors of production, as they were called, land, labor, and capital. And of course, land meant everything we're talking about. Not only are we talking about land, we're talking about all the, the value of coal in the ground or oil. Um, you could also contain in that all the externalities, how you heard other people, natural monopolies, the monopoly, the government granted monopoly that we have. Sorry, am I going to fight that? Thanks. I'll get there. Um, but neoclassical economics removed land. They only talk about labor and capital. They confuse land with capital. And that's the problem we've got in our economic system today that monopoly of ownership of land is the fundamental problem whereby we call it capital. It's not. It's land. It's monopoly. GDP. GDP is a rubbish measurement of how much the, the economy is improving. Even the guy who's called Fisher, who invented GP in America in, during the Second World War, he said it was useless because it didn't have depletion or dilapidation, depletion of natural resources, dilapidation where things start falling apart. You need to have basic concepts. You look at some of these economics, the people, you read the economics that actually these people who created these concepts and they, they, they were clever people who had it sus, but it's all been dropped from GDP. Money supply, the endless abuse of nature because money supply, where's money made? Where's money created? It's created when you take out a loan in a bank. Over 97% of all money is created at the point where somebody makes a loan. It's not created by the government. So we need to think about that because if you can get a right to abuse nature, there is an endless supply of money for you to pay for you to destroy that nature. So we've got to look at the money system. Oh, um, the discount factor, the idea that something is worth less in the future. So it's always economic to destroy today, not to save for tomorrow, right? Discount factor, very, very important. Externalities spent, rent in Ricardo, the Ricardo theory. The economy grows, but nobody gets any wealth. There's tons of money in this world, but we've got a billion people in abject, utter starvation poverty. Even in this country, we've got a massive underclass, yet there's so much money. And that's just because of rent. Because if you have land or another monopoly, all money will go towards that monopoly. This is, was beautifully written in the progr book Progress and Poverty by Henry George. Monopoly's the reason. Imagine I start uh, um, a game of Monopoly, right? You've got Whitechapel, I own all the other squares, and I've got all the money in the bank. And you don't get any richer. I wonder why? Because the rules of the game. Monopoly was actually created by a woman who understood Progress and Poverty, Renton Ricardo. And there were two sets of rules. It was taken over and changed. But one set of rules had a land value tax in it and one set of rules didn't. If you played with the land value tax set of rules, everybody was equal, nobody got monopoly, and the world was a happy place. Tax, at core, even if you look at the inefficiencies of our tax structure, by, by taxing our wages and ca true capital, you actually cause a terrible problem for, um, because it comes out of rent anyway. So the landowner's rent will be reduced, but the inefficiencies of that process of interest, of, of economic rents of all terms, means that everything we do is effectively taxed at a 50% rate. So if you go and buy a Mars bar, if you go and do anything, if you go and um, work, not just your own taxes, but all of the rent that is contained, all of the rents, economic rents, both rent on land, but rents on other ways, that are contained in the process of the creation of something is about 50%. It's a massive drag on the economy, the efficient side of the economy. So um, that's Lockean theory. John Locke came out with that in 1691, and he was clever, and yet still in modern economics, they won't recognize that. So political abuse. Um, protect my privilege. Politics is more about protecting people's privileges than actually doing anything else. People, for some reason, would rather have their, their privilege, 
protected privilege of destroying nature than actually have taxes lifted off what they actually do and free up their economy. The tragedy of the privates, as I like to call it, the tragedy of the commons was not the tragedy of the commons. Even the guy who wrote the tragedy of commons, he said it wasn't. It's the tragedy of the unmanaged commons. When we have the managed commons, it's all fine. But by giving the problem we've got in this country is land is held by individuals who've got almost sovereign rights to decide with it. And we have to pay the full value of rent or capital value to get access to the land. But each individual landowner makes decisions that are for their own economic advantage, not for society's advantage or to create wildlife. We've got to understand political science, selective theory. My time's running out. I'll have to be pretty quick. So if you start learning political science, really deeply learning political science, study it. It's all about the selective theory is a wonderful theory, and you should look at it. The electorate and the winning coalition is who? What's the electorate in this country? It's actually the electorate in this country is a few people in marginal seats, right? probably less than 350,000 people would decide who's going to, um, they swing backwards and forwards. So that's the electric. So that's, that's the people who have to be influenced in our political system. The winning coalition are the, or your Labour Party or your Conservative Party. Who elects them? Who makes those party leaders? Again, it's very few people. If you look at it, it's a few newspaper barons. It's a few party bigwigs, a few union bosses, depending on which side. This is not democracy. Representative democracy is rubbish. It doesn't work because a tiny number of people are actually selecting who gets to make laws in this country. So if you, essentials and replacements are, are, if you think of government ministers, they're replacements because they're easily replaced. They're not powerful. Essentials are people like newspaper barons and others who actually make the decisions, party donors, who get people into political power, who, who manipulate our laws and government, who've got more influence than anybody else. The fundamental solutions that we need is we, we need the efficient use of land. Land below the margin, the land that cannot be effectively farmed for profit, should become wild land. We need real national parks and a nature grid to connect them. We need economic rent and externalities as government revenue. The simplest way to talk about this is the land value tax. Land value tax and externality taxes should replace all other taxes. You pay for what you receive because if you're a rent seeker, if you're a landowner, the portion of your income that is just the location of that value, it's not yours. You didn't create it. If you have a monopoly, you're getting extra profits for doing no work, for graft and corruption. So that's not yours. It should be the basis of our taxation. Also, you've got to pay for what you take. If you rob the environment, if you pollute the environment, if you steal bits of our children's future, you should pay for it. And of course, you need laws to stop really bad sides of that. Positive money. Money should not be created privately by banks. It should be created by government. Um, you can look up on positive money or all the other modern monetary theories how money should be spent into the economy. And that would save us about 50 odd to 100 billion quid a year if we did that. You need real democracy, not this, this fiction of democracy that we have in this country. You need proper education and free speech. The law is a terrible thing in this country. It stops people talking a lot freely, the, the, the libel laws. There's so many things that stop good free discussion. Even in my, if I said this speech like I am now in my previous charity, I'd have lost my job. And I'm not joking, I would have, because you couldn't talk about land. You couldn't, I mean, things are changing now. But you know, 20 years ago in the Wildlife Trust Movement, I couldn't mention any of these things, even though I'm not really being radical, I'm not left or right or politicians. I'm just talking about things, how they are, to the best of knowledge. They understand in politics the difference between liberty and duties. At the moment, a lot of people talk about liberties, but of course they're talking about liberties to actually oppress somebody else. True liberty means that you don't hurt others in what you do, and that should be a fundamental basis. You can't have a full liberty, and you need to understand the difference. Population control. This is one that often talked about. You don't need population control with an economic system. Look at 
real countries where you've had populations going up and down. Look at the factors that have influenced them. It's things to do with security. It's things to do with um, economic security, physical security, um, social education. These are the things that really do control populations, that will push the population from going up to going down. And they're the most, where you've had population controls that have been tried to force by governments, they don't work. Beautiful debate between Thomas Malthus, you might have heard of Malthusian theory, Thomas Malthus. He said that the population would always expand to the, the, the carrying capacity and nothing we could do, let's shoot the poor, or, or let them starve. Henry George, took this apart and looked at societies at the time. A great man, read his book, Progress and Poverty, true genius. He took this apart and showed that where you had decent societies, you had population control. The human population has the ability to control itself and even drop down below replacements. And we could control our population without any benefit. The trouble is, is all of the things you need to control human population are the all the things that are going to make rich and wealthy people less rich and wealthy because it's their privileges that create the poverty, that create the war, the perverse incentives that make the society like it is, that somehow stimulate humans to breed like rabbits. And employment, welfare, you need to remove the poverty trap to, to fill all this. It's, it's the thing about jobs. Can you have a society that's green and protects the environment and have lots of jobs? Of course, if we listen to our politicians in general debate, they will say, no, if you have wildlife protection, if we have nature reserves, if we clean our rivers up, it's gonna cost jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, not with an economic system like I've said. If you take away poverty traps, if you have universal benefits derived from land rents, um, a universal citizen's dividend. You have no poverty trap and you have no taxes on your labor. There's no poverty, people will work when they want to. Lots of people will work a bit more, some won't work some more. But a universal benefit will create, get rid of all the poverty traps and you won't have unemployment. You won't have problems. Um, you, there'll be more jobs, people will be desperate. I'll have to spend a lot more money trying to attract people to come and work for us. That's it. Thank you very much for that, Peter.